This segment of Hack 5 is brought to you by the Ford Focus Electric. Good morning, Internet. I got into uh, tour camp last night, like really late. It was like 10.30 p.m. and it was really dark and um, a little bit of a bummer, I must say, because the roads were like super twisty and going through what you know could potentially be epic scenery, but I'll see that on the way out. Um, but it, it's kind of cool because it puts me in that situation or maybe you've been in one of these similar ones where you get in super late and you don't really have any context of where you are, you've never been there before and you wake up in the morning and you go, which, which I haven't done because I've never even been to Washington so I have no idea what to expect so this is weird, I'm seeing it on the phone before I see it with my eyes Well, <laughs> that's a lot of fog. <laughs> no joke, I could have stayed in the Bay Area for that much fog. <laughs> I'm like expecting some ridiculous reveal. I mean, don't get me wrong, the Canadian geese are awesome. But, uh, um... <laughs> Let me try this again in the afternoon. So Matthew, what are you doing with crazy balloons here at Tour Camp? Uh, well, we've been flying balloons uh, all day, Thursday, uh, a little bit yesterday, today. Um, I was flying them to make maps, uh, so made a map on Thursday, imaged, uh, imaged today, haven't, haven't stitched the map today. And then uh, Jeff uh, Records and I were launching some antennas. So yesterday we got up a 75-foot uh, um, Zeppelin antenna, which is originally they fly them on the tops of Zeppelin. It's a, uh, dipole, just basic dipole. We got that 75 feet off the ground. Uh, we're able to pick up some cool traffic, and uh, also launched uh, a Wi-Fi router and did some did some Wi-Fi distance tests off the balloon. So yeah, it's been a lot of fun. So what on earth brought you into playing with balloons and hacking them? Oh, because balloons are awesome. Uh, I love them. I've been obsessed with uh, flight and uh, for a long time, and uh, I remember just seeing a low altitude uh, model hot air balloon and getting completely obsessed starting with hot air balloons uh, then moving to these and uh, kites um, the map we made on Thursday was actually with a DIY kite but yeah it, so, so it didn't like start with like oh, I really want to make maps and oh no. balloons it was it was balloons first like what back in boys life magazine or something growing up no actually I just uh, back in 2000 end of 2007 beginning of 2008 uh, I was just like I was just I got excited about it um, I didn't really have any applications for it until uh, spring of 2010 when I hooked up with uh, the folks who were working on this grassroots mapping project around the Gulf uh, oil spill and that was uh, we all came together I was working from a distance on uh, the balloon and techniques and stuff and we started the public laboratory as a extension of that to kind of popularize and continue our process of mapping. And so what is your process of mapping, uh, you know, getting those aerial photography when it comes to balloons and, and where can people see those? Sure, well publiclaboratory.org slash archive is our data archive. We uh, modeled it after data.gov and you can go there and get uh, any of our maps in standard formats. You can go to mapknitter.org and make your own map with our map stitching software. It's a, it's a web browser software. And on our site you can buy our kit, you can make your own kit. We got a lot of DIY, fully DIY options um, and uh, yeah. So, so you talk about stitching. Um, how does that come into play? I mean, what's the actual process of putting, you know, your equipment up in the air and, and bringing, and bringing it back down, bringing the data back down somehow, and and putting that together into something usable? Sure. Well, it starts with getting some stabilized photos. So it starts with these. Um, like this is a photo rig that I used uh, from a kite on uh, Thursday to image this place and from the balloon today. So this is a soda bottle uh, with my cam my Canon camera inside and I'd turn it on and uh, point it to the uh, horizon to get messages and if you hear it it's clicking away right now. Uh, it's just a rubber band over the shutter and then it's stabilized into the wind because uh, of this tail. 
so it doesn't get any rotational images. So yeah, this thing goes to about 1,000 feet. We can go up to 4,000 feet, generally about 1,000 feet. Uh, I took most of the maps here from about 800. And then um, take a bunch of photos. Uh, you know, imaging tour camp took uh, 560 photos, then sorted them down to five good ones that just covered the whole uh, area. And then uh, in Map Knitter, Map Knitter starts with uh, with satellite imagery. So we lay the satellite, the satellite imagery is laid down, and then you drop the your photos on top of that and uh, stretch them until you, the features you see in your photo match those in the ground. Um, yeah, that's the whole process. And so you've got your scale, and then if you've taken multiple images, it puts those together and finds where those uh, intersections are. It's uh, it's manual. You know, there are automatic stitching programs, there are automatic georectification programs, but because of the images we're getting, we uh, it, the easiest way to do both stitching and georectification is to lay them all in manually. Uh, yeah. So tell me, what was your first balloon that you actually started taking photographs with? First balloon I took uh, photographs from was a solar hot air balloon. I actually have one of those with me, but we're in northern Washington, so it's no way it's going to fly. Um, those are the most fun, cheapest, least reliable way to fly anything. You need no wind, perfect sun, and uh, the equivalent lift of this balloon behind us uh, would be a 12-foot balloon. So, and, and so what is this balloon behind us? Is this what you, uh, you use in your kits? Yeah, this is a chloropene rubber balloon that's neoprene. Uh, and um, it, they're pretty good at holding helium. It's not really a weather balloon. This is the result of a uh, used car salesman's uh, aerospace program. Uh, they, uh, you know, if you go by, they've got like, you know, buy now, get our balloon, you know, get they have huge balloons up and banners and stuff. It's the same balloons they use. Uh, and uh, they, they hold helium much better than weather balloons. Uh, weather balloons, latex weather balloons uh, lose their helium after a day. This we filled up yesterday, uh, about this time, and still going strong, probably, uh, you know, the whole weekend. Three, three to four days is about what we get. You lose, depending on the temperature change, five to 15% a day of helium, so. And, and coming by helium, is that tricky? Unfortunately, there's a helium shortage right now. Uh, it's the result of a lot of supply changes. Um, and so it's a little tricky right now. It's unfortunate, but um, it's not too bad. This balloon has about 40 bucks worth of helium in it. 30 to 40 dollars worth of helium is what generally gets you flying. So, okay. So when you first started flying, what did you know about uh, like regulations or what you even needed to to have signed off on to even be able to do that? Because you mentioned like 4,000 feet. Um, is that an obstruction to like general aviation? No. Uh, as long as you're away from an airport, stay five miles away from an airport, stay out of special exclusion zones, uh, military bases, Washington, D.C. Um, other than that, you just need to stay uh, 300 feet below the cloud layer. That's, so that could be anywhere up to 14 to 20,000 feet in some places. Practically, you can't get that high. You'll kill your arms trying to reel the balloon back in. So um, yeah, the, there, are no, there are no barriers to that. It's basically any balloon that's less than six feet in diameter and any kite that weighs less than five pounds aren't regulated by the um, F. Oh, okay, so, so if it's less than six feet in diameter, which this obviously is, uh, you can go, what, what, what's the ceiling on that? 300 feet below the cloud layer. So it's where the clouds are. So, so 300 feet beyond the, below the cloud layer, but if there's no clouds whatsoever, as much real as you have? Yeah, yeah, it's much it's much string. I mean, practically, you're not going to be able to put out more than a six foot balloon can't lift more than uh, three and a half pounds gross lift. Including. And I'm sure I'm sure most of that weight is actually in the line that you're yeah. using, right? Right. So by the time you get to you're getting to four thousand, five thousand feet, you're pushing the amount of line you can lift. So. And uh, and what kind of line do you use? I mean, obviously, you're looking for something strong to be able to go up that high, uh, but you're going to need it to be light. W what have you found that works best? Well, I started with the. I started going for the thinnest, strongest stuff. Dyneema, Spectra. Uh, this stuff is Dacron. Um, Dacron is really nice. It's a little flexible. It's easy to tie knots. The other fibers, the the, the Dyneema, the um, Spectra, the Aramid, the Kevlar fibers, they all have a problem with uh, holding knots, knots breaking. Um, none of them are stretchy. So when the balloon gets to, like, when the wind pulls it, there's no give in the line. Really snaps the balloon. Um, so the, the Dacron's not quite as strong for its diameter, but it, it's the easiest to use uh, thin line. And what is this stuff typically used for? Uh, this is just kite line. It's sold as kite line, manufactured as kite line. Uh, there are a lot of people in the world who love kites, so yeah, the whole industry.
And so when you've got uh, you know a three pound payload, most of it's taken up by your um, uh, by your line. What, what kind of payloads are you putting up, and, and in what kind of use cases have have you uh, deployed these? Well, so just yesterday we put up an antenna that weighed three pounds. Uh, ma- that we basically maxed out the payload on the balloon, but uh, the little cameras we fly are uh, it's like 300 to 500 gram payloads those are the easiest ones to get to altitude um, and uh, yeah it's about so in your talk you were uh, showing some stuff from uh, Occupy Wall Street can you tell me a bit about that sure that was just folks at Occupy Wall Street who saw our site um, uh, they had seen uh, Kaja Social Social Inteligente I believe uh, or Inteligente Social, I'm trying to remember the name of it. They're a group in uh, uh, Chile who'd done some protest mapping. And so they were actually just using uh, a, a, an adapted version of our, our techniques. And so they were, uh, yeah, the Occupy Wall Street people just found out about it, thought it was cool, uh, picked it up, and went for it. And then how did Google end up finding out about it? Because you were also showing, uh, you know, the maps in, uh, in Google Earth or Google Maps. Right, well, we contacted, uh, we contacted Google back and uh, back during the, uh, the Gulf spill. It took a while to coordinate with them, but then now we're one of their data providers. So they, they sync with our database every three months. And uh, most maps make it into historical archive data in Google Earth, but if Google determines that your map is better than existing coverage, they throw it straight into the base layer of, uh, of Google Maps. So yeah. And, and how do these maps uh, from your uh, project compete with like, some of the other stuff from like USGS, and what are some of the differences there? Um, our maps are more transparent, they're generally high resolution, and uh, they uh, look funkier because they always have jagged edges from all our photos. So I say they're more transparent um, because if you look at one of our maps, so if you, you, just if you find it, in, uh, in Photoshop. Well, no, no, I mean like from a data transparency side. Right, right, no. So for, on our site, you know, you go to MapNitter, you can find the original images that were used to stitch it. You can find the original author, you can look at the original EXIF data from the camera, verify the time. Um, so there's this level of data transparency. Who was making the map, why, where, when, with what images, what type of manipulation was done on those images. That's not data you can get from USGS or from any of the other commercial uh, uh, imagery providers that Google and other map makers use. So I, I really, I think people really appreciate that. Um, with satellite imagery, um, a lot of imagery in maps is, is, is from airplane overflight, but from satellite imagery, the maximum resolution you can get is uh, five centimeters, which means each pixel is you know about five centimeters, about like that big. And um, with our map making process, because we're flying so low, even though we're just using cheap consumer cameras, we get really high uh, resolution. So five centimeter resolution is pretty normal. Uh, better cameras and lower flights. A lot of people do one and two centimeter resolution maps. So we're getting nice high resolution. And beyond high resolution, because we're flying so low, there's not the atmospheric filtering that happens. You know, you look at satellite imagery, it's very blue, it's very green. It's got a lot of this, um, it's missing a lot of the reds, it's missing uh, um, it, it, a lot of the colors filtered out. So we get much more vibrant color, higher contrast image. Uh, there's just a lot more data in it. And so when you're putting a, a a balloon up with like a 10 megapixel camera, um, how do you know how much coverage you're going to get uh, for what altitude and things like that? Well, every lens is different. Point and shoots, for the most part, have uh, fairly simple lenses, and you can estimate that you're making a 45 degree cone to the ground. So if you're a thousand feet up, you're getting photos that are about a thousand feet wide. That's so awesome. I'm truly inspired. I want to like just run out and cool throw up a, a um, I don't know, like a panel antenna, GSM tower or something over my whole town. Um, how, do, how would I go about getting started with this? You say you've got kits. Where can people find that kind of stuff? Publiclaboratory.org. Uh, look for our tool, balloon mapping. It's on there. We have a host of other tools as well that were in development. But um, yeah, we've got instructions on balloons. We have recommendations for commercial kites. Um, and uh, yeah, you'll find the whole process there. Little, We have a little checklist right at the top of our balloon mapping page with all the steps you got to go to to get flying safely. So I love that. Thank you so much, Matthew. Really appreciate it. Today we're once again sponsored by our friends at Ford and you'll remember that last time we had a lot of fun checking out the amazing technology in the 2013 Ford Focus ST. This week, all right, the Ford Focus Electric. 
We're taking a closer look at the mileage and electric range found here in the Ford Focus Electric. And so get this, being that it's 100% electric with zero emissions and 110 MPGE city, that's miles per gallon electric equivalent, this actually makes the Ford Focus Electric the most fuel efficient five passenger vehicle in America. Of course, your efficiency will go up and down depending on your unique driving style. Fuel efficiency is just one of the awesome features that goes into the Ford Focus Electric. We've been having so much fun with it and we'll continue to in future episodes of Hack 5, so stay tuned for that. And once again, thank you guys to Ford for sponsoring Hack 5 and showing your commitment to technology.